20. Cool. All right. So we do have a new homework assignment. So we have overlapping homework assignment in this case. So just functions is released um, today. You have one week to work on this one. So we do have an overlap, that, but that should be plenty of time to get both done. Um, we were done with function as a set, or functions as sets. Uh, we This is the new homework assignment. It's due on the 19th, right before class. So you have one week to work on this one. Um, we talked about injection, surjection, and bijection last time. So that part should be done as well in terms of the lecture. So let's go back to this module. And let me see right here. And this is the full screen version. What we have not done last time is the discussion of inverse functions. So we'll start with inverse functions. But before I get started here, do we have any questions about the material that we have talked about so far? No questions? Everybody is feeling comfortable with the notations? The concept of injection, the concept of surjection. No, no questions whatsoever. All right, that's good. I hope. All right. So with inverse, um, it means so this is the notation of inverse is f, you know, kind of like to the power of negative one. Is that notation familiar to you? Uh, because you know in um, in trig you know arc you know sine is also sine and then you know superscript negative one um, is the inverse. All right, so yep. Are you recording? I believe so. No. Yes, I am. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me to check. All right. So inverse function, right? So if the original function is bijection, is a bijection, which means it's a bijective function, and the original domain of f is x and the codomain is y, then as long as we know f is a bijection, then it has to, there has to exist a, another bijection, which is f inverse, which uses y as the domain and x as the codomain. In other words, we just flip the directions. Okay, such that for every element e in x, f inverse applied to f of e is just e. Okay, that's a kind of obscure way to look at things. So what we'll do is we are going to take a look at an alternative explanation of what this means. So I'm going to start up the screen share from the tablet. So let me move that to the screen that you can see. There we go. Okay, so I'm just going to work with um, things that you already know. Okay, so we'll take a look at, um, let's define f of x to be 2x. Okay, so that means you know, f of 1 is 2, f of 4 is 8, f of 11 is 22, and so on. So are we good so far with how f is defined? So how, how would you define f inverse in this case? One half x, yes. or would you use y in that case? Or I know it's x because you're using x in the variable name. So one half, or x over 2. x over 2, or x divided by 2, you know, yep, there we go. So what does that mean, right? You know, so if you apply, so the theory is if you apply f of uh, f inverse to f of any value x, you should get x back. Does that? Yep. Go ahead. Um, I was going to ask a quick uh, question. So, like in the case of, so uh, we've had where all x goes straight up into one y, right? Or is that? I'm not sure. Where like uh, every value of y or every value of x has a unique y. That makes it an injection. Yep. Oh, mm -hmm. so that's an injection, not a y. Right. Okay. I was going to ask when the case, what is like the case of x raised to the second power, where one and negative one are both. Or never mind. 
Well, that would not be a bijection. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So a bijection is required in order for a inverse function to exist. But the inverse function itself is also guaranteed to be a bijection. Okay. Are we good? All right. So there are other representations of you know, what is an injection. Some people like to use it like this, you know, kind of like a more graphical way. So this is an injection, but it is not a surjection because you know, if this is the if this is the domain and y is the codomain, then we have everything in x mapping to a unique thing in y, but we have the extra two elements in y that are not mapped from anything in x. So this is an injection, but not a surjection. On the other hand, if you have a situation like this, okay, then we have a, the opposite. We have a, this is not an injection, because you can see how two elements of x map to the same thing in y, but it is a surjection, because everything in y are used. Okay, there's at least one thing mapping to everything in y. Is that okay? So some people prefer to look at it kind of in a more graphical way. I personally prefer the more kind of the, the, the dry definition way because it's just a little bit more concise and there's no ambiguation in that case. So when we have a bijection, then you're looking at something that's like this. Once again, x is the domain, y is the codomain. So this is a bijection because it is both injective and surjective at the same time. So are we doing okay so far? Okay, so I'll give you one last thing, okay? What is missing in this picture? Something that is neither an injection nor a surjection, right? So that one is actually pretty easy to make, okay? So you have two things mapping to the same thing, and then one thing mapping to one other thing, and then one thing is not used. So now it is not an injection nor a surjection. It's, it is a function, okay? What qualifies as a function? Let me just try to go back a little bit to see if you guys do remember what makes a set of two tuples that is a subset of the Cartesian product of the domain and the codomain a function. That was a long sentence, but I hope you guys are catching the entire thing. Yes? That's okay. Well, that's a good try. So what makes a set of two tuples that is already a subset of the Cartesian product between the domain and the codomain, a function, is everything in the domain maps to one and only one thing in the codomain. That's the, that's the most precise way I can describe it using just English. Now, on the other hand, if we can use notations, there are much better ways you know, to describe it. So all four of these are functions, because if you look at you know, x, it has three elements. So in all four cases, each element of x maps to one and only one thing in y, which is the codomain. So that makes you know, the mapping a function already. The first one, once again, is an injection, but not a surjection. The second one is a is not an injection, but it's a surjection. The third one is both an, a, an injection and a surjection, making it a bijection. The last one is neither an injection nor a surjection. So we have all possi four possible ways of you know, qualifying you know, a function. But all four are functions to begin with. So are we good so far? This is more or less a review of the definitions of injection, surjection, and bijection. We all good here, okay? So if I were to say this is injection, this is surjection, then we are gonna tick this one, cross this one, cross this one, tick this one, check both of those, and cross both of those.
All right. Okay. So getting back to your inverse function. So in this specific example of defining f of x as 2x and defining f inverse as x divided by 2, does everybody see that if I apply f to x first and then I apply f inverse to the result of f of x, we just get x back? Is that good? All right. Okay. Excellent. Because you know, that's the whole concept of an inverse function. All right, so we get back to this slide here. And I believe last time we talked about um, we talked about this one, you know, why, you know, in the case of a bijection, you know, for every element in the codomain, um, and you construct a set P with elements looking like PQ where PQ is an element of F, and if you look at the cardinality of this, it should be just one, which means you know there's one and only one thing mapping to each element in the codomain. But F has to be a function to begin with in order for this qualification to further qualify the function as a bijection. So that's also kind of what we talked about last time. All right, so I'm just going to pause a little bit here and see if there are any questions about everything that I have mentioned in the past 15 minutes. Yep, go ahead. So with an inverse function, what basically is happening is the codomain and the domain when you represent it as an inverse function, they flip. So y becomes the domain and x becomes the codomain. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you know the function already, you can define the inverse function because you're just flipping the two tuples. The second item and the first item just flip take places. So the way to specify that, okay, you know, so let's let's see if we can construct you know, and describe an inverse function. Okay, so we'll, we'll try our best. So let's just say that we know f colon x points to y is Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a bijection. There we go. Okay, so this is given. Okay, so we are given a particular function f. X is the domain, y is a codomain, and we also know it is a bijection, which means it is both injective and surjective. So how, how would we describe f inverse? So, so I'm going to use no, no, notations here. So we are going to say for every u v as a two tuple, that is an element of f, if and only if, um, let's see, excuse me, you know, because for every element like this, then v u, remember we are flipping the order of the elements in the two tuple, this has to be in F inverse. Now, is that a good definition of an inverse function? Let's check it out. Okay, so we're going to define a weird function. So we're going to define F. Um, okay, so before we can define F, we can de we have to define X first, which is our domain. Come on. There we go. So we'll just say that X is um, 0, 1, and 2. And then y is defined to be a, b, and c. Okay. And we'll go ahead and define f as a function. We'll just make it somewhat arbitrary. So we will say it's 2 maps to a, 0 maps to c, and then 1 maps to the only remaining item, which is b. First of all, do we know whether this f is a function or not? I claim that it is, but does it meet the requirements to be a function? First requirement, are we looking at a subset between uh, a subset of the Cartesian product between x and y? Yeah. Okay, it looks like that, okay? Then the second question is, is every element of x mapping to one and only one element in the codomain, y? Okay, that works out. So f is a function. Next, is it an injection? is f an injection. In other words, 
does every element of x map to a unique element in y? Or the other way to say that is no two elements of x map to the same thing in y, which is, yep, okay, meets that requirement. Is it a surjection? Is everything in y mapped to from something in x? Okay, so this is a bijection. So now the question is, what makes an inverse function? So I propose, okay, that this will define you know, f inverse as a as a uh, as a inverse function. So using that definition, I think most of you will say, okay, so we know what is in f inverse. Um, two a becomes a two. Okay, cool. Uh, C zero becomes you know, a zero c becomes c zero, and then b one b becomes b one. Okay, so far so good. Looks like an inverse function, right? You know, everything is just, you know, flipping order. But according to the definition of here, we can, can we have some other things in F inverse? Does it preclude anything else to be in F inverse? In other words, can I just say, hmm, tech, which is not even a two-tuple. So the question is, is this F inverse as a set definition, does it still satisfy this requirement? No, it still meets that requirement. You go like, how? How can that be? Yes? Because it says for all of UV, that is a element of right? But that's a filter, right? So what is the other way to say this? What is the longer and more cumbersome way of doing the same thing? So the more cumbersome way of doing this is to say, for all u in the entire universe, for all v in the entire universe, okay, uv is in f implies that vu is in f inverse. That is one there we go. That's okay. Do you remember this equivalency? Okay, let me point to the equivalency here. Do you remember this is really a shorthand of that? Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So okay. So what's wrong with this? Well, okay. That means tag cannot be in here. Fine. We'll we'll change this example because it has to be a two tuple. So we'll go ahead and say tag. Iraj. I cannot set the spell Iraj. Don't tell him. There we go. Okay. So is tag part of the universe? I hope so. I'm still a part of the universe. Hopefully for another decade or two or so. Um, Iraj is still a part of the universe, right? So that means I can instantiate you as, okay, I, I know that sounds really weird. I can instantiate variable u as tag. I can instantiate variable v as iraj, right? Because we are both a part of the universe. So now the question is, is tag comma iraj as a two tuple a part, you know, an element of f? If you look up the definition of f here and go like, nope, it is not. Okay. So that may, that means the left hand side of the implication is false. It's false, okay? Tag, comma, iraj as a two-tuple is not in F. Okay? But what does that mean? What is the value of the implication? True. It is true. Okay. So that means you know, it does not preclude tag, iraj as a two-tuple to be in F inverse. So what do we need to make sure that you know, we actually make sure that happens? It's a very minor modification. So what I'll do, okay, this is the trick. So I'm going to take most, okay, I know I couldn't do it that way because it's too close to the edge. So I've got to rewrite this whole thing. Uh, shape, black, there we go. So for all, everything in the universe U, for everything in the universe V, UV, 
is an element of f, and then we have u, du as an element of f inverse, close paren, and then close paren. Okay, so I'm missing an operator in between. We know the implication doesn't work because it's eh, too loose as a definition. Okay, it's too loose as an operator. So what do we need to do right here in order to say, but do not include extra stuff in F inverse. If right there. If and only if, very good. Okay, so that is the trick. Okay, so we can now say, if and only if here, now it works because it means tag iraj is not in F, right? So iraj tag cannot be in F inverse. The if and only if makes all the difference here. Are we still doing okay so far? So the the real difference here, you know, why am I being so picky about this? This is the difference between if, which is just implication, versus if and only if, which is implication, but going in both directions. So in normal language, okay, in English, okay, whether you use if and only if, I doubt anyone actually use you know, if and only if in a normal conversation, versus just if, versus only if, most of the time it is not that important. From the context, most people will understand, oh, okay, you meant that. But in mathematics or in definitions like these, just missing the other direction back changes the meaning of the statement. So we have to be a little bit more specific when you know, and be mindful of which operator we choose to use. If and only if versus just implication sounds like the same, but they are definitely not the same. Are we still doing okay so far? Does everybody understand the difference between the use of implications versus the use of, you know, um, if and only if or equivalence, and why only if and only if is making sense in this case. Good? Okay. So this statement here is helping us to define F inverse given what F is. Because if we can find you know some two tuple uv in f, then we know vu has to be in f inverse. Are we still doing okay so far with all of these notations? Okay, all right. All right, so assuming we are okay with these notations, we'll kind of move forward. So now we have um, a statement here. Uh, given the bijection f that maps from x to y, there's another bijection f inverse y maps to x, such that what is what does that say? It says you know for every e in x, f inverse applied to f of e is e. We kind of mentioned that already, but the other one is to do it in the opposite way. For every e in y, which is the codomain of f but it is the domain of F inverse, this, is all, this also has to be true. So meaning that you know, it has to be a bi-directional thing. So the proof is basically the rest of all of this stuff here. And you know, if you want to read through this, you know, that's good. If you do not want to read through that, it's not too bad either. Okay, so I'm not gonna ask questions about this particular proof. All right. But the bottom line, yes, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was just asking, um, I believe this is, you mentioned it before, but the reason why bijection is important is because it's used for proof for sorting, correct? Or that's just one of the... Uh, that's one of my examples, okay? You know, but it is actually useful in the next big topic, which has to do with uh, Aleph Null. So Aleph Null is, Aleph is a, I think it's an Arabic alphabet or Arabic um, letter? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So Aleph Null you know, refers to a 
certain set. Okay, it it refers to the cardinality of there are several sets. Okay, but the same cardinality. One of those is the set of natural numbers. So another way to say you know the cardinality of the set of natural number is it is all of no. You go like, what does that mean? How many natural numbers do we have? An infinite number of natural numbers. Because if somebody says, um, I think this is the last, you know, the greatest you know, natural number, then I'll ask, what about one plus that? Right? That's also a natural number. So that means you know, there's an infinite number of natural numbers. So when I say the number of natural numbers or the cardinality of the set of natural numbers is out of null, that means there has to be some other sets with the same cardinality. Because otherwise, it doesn't make sense to give it a name. Does that make sense to you? So what if I were to say to you that the set of all integers is also out of null? Let me write it down. Because I want you guys to ponder on this one just a little bit before I start to explain. So we know the cardinality is the bar bar notation. So this is the typical way that we uh, look at natural numbers. Okay, this is a funny looking n. So the cardinality of natural numbers is actually the same as the cardinality of integers, which is you know, what we define as olive no. And I cannot remember how to write olive. <laughs> so I have to I have to cheat a little bit and actually go into one of my notes here. So this is the next topic. So we'll take a look because I cannot remember how to write alif as a letter. So I can look it up. Okay, there we go. So it kind of look like a squiggly n. So if I cannot completely write it correctly, please do not feel offended. Is that close? Is that close enough? Passable? Okay. All right. So that doesn't make sense, okay? It just doesn't make sense, right? Because if you think about it, every natural number is a is an integer. Does that work out? Okay. So that means uh, the set of natural number is a subset of the set of integers. Yes? Okay. But not every integer is a natural number. Negative 6 is, a, is an integer, but it's not a natural number. So you would think, I mean, I would think too, I mean, before this class, I would think that doesn't make sense. You know, because if I really need to establish the relationship between the, the cardinality of the set of all natural numbers versus the cardinality of all the integers, it should not be an equal. It, it should be a less than. Because there are things in the set of integers that are not in the set of natural numbers, but not the other way around. Does that make sense to you? It sounds intuitive, right? And yet, we say, no, no, they are the same, and we can call both of those out of no. That doesn't make sense, because you know, it's, an infinite, it's, a, it's a number that is infinitely large, and we are now saying there's a symbol to represent it. It just doesn't make sense. So we'll get to why we can say something like that once we get to the next module. But for now, we are focusing on just bijection, uh, the concept of a function versus the inverse function. Do we have any questions about all, all of those concepts for that? Any questions? Okay, all right. So what we're going to do is to move on to Aleph Null. So we are now on the Aleph Null module, which in the um, sequence is over here. It has its own little title as a module, and it's called Aleph Null. And let me take a look at, let's go ahead and take row first, okay? Because I want to give you guys a little bit of a pause so that you can kind of let this stuff sink in. So go ahead and get your mobile device out, and it's going to take me a little bit of time first you know, to set this up. So 11108, 
and I'm going to put it into functions after injection, surjection, and bijection. There. Okay. All right, so it's already there, but you cannot do a single thing about it because it's past due already. So let me go ahead and change that stuff first. Alrighty. Eh, we'll call this inverse. There we go. And I'll give you guys that till the end of the whole class, 420 again. Save. There we go. All right, so it should be available to you now. The access code is inverse. Oh, 906. Hmm? Oh, did I forget to change the date? Nope, I, I changed it. So just refresh your browser. It should see it now. I just meant the title of it. Oh, the title? Oh, yeah. The, the title is still 0906. <laughs> forgot to change that. This part has to be scriptable. Canvas actually has an API. Pull from system date. Hmm? It said pull from system date. Yep. All right. Are we, are we good so far? All right. So now we switch to the note. Okay, we can switch back to here. All right. So now the question is, how do we... Okay, so the next question is, can you write a function? Can you make? Can you think of a way? Okay, you know, don't think about functions. Think about a way so that you can map from uh, natural numbers to integers. Or the other... Well, let me see. The other way around. Okay, so let's see if you can come up with a way to map integers to natural numbers. So we are looking for an f that goes from the set of all integers to the set of all natural numbers without any other constraints. Okay, so we just need a function right now. So give me some options. It doesn't have to be bijective, okay? So you can give me something that is like, Oh, since you're only looking for a function, that's a function. Yep. Uh, what about the absolute value of x? Absolute value? Well, that'll work. Okay, so we can say f of x is the absolute value of x. That would do the trick because that's going to map every integer to one and only one natural number. Okay, that works. But if I have no extra requirements, I can also define f to be just that. <laughs> Is that a function? Yeah, yeah because you know, I'm mapping every single integer to zero. Is zero a natural number? Yes. So we're all good. Well, except these functions are not really particularly useful. So instead of doing these functions, we're going to make another function. So I'm going to define f of x here to be a, I use a ternary expression. So I'm going to say if x is less than 0, then we're going to have negative x. I have to remember what it is now. Minus 1. Otherwise, it's 2x. Okay. So let me put extra parentheses to be sure. All right. First of all, I hope by now you're familiar or at least comfortable with ternary expressions. That's a ternary expression. We have a condition, a then value, and then a else value. Are we doing okay with ternary expressions? Okay, it's basically an if then else kind of compressed into a single expression. Okay, so with this definition, let me ask you, what is f of zero? zero? f of zero is just zero. Okay, what about f of one? 
to, what about f of negative 1? Zero. No. One. It's 1. Because one. we negate, oh, okay, you're <laughs> correct. I, okay, I missed something, sorry. That was, that was my bad, my bad. <laughs> Minus 2x, there we go. Okay. Now it's 1. Now it's 1, very good. Okay, that was my bad, I do apologize. Mm-hmm. But we have negative two now. Because I forgot that I am supposed to have a negative two and not just negate x. So if it's a negative two, okay, so if x is negative one, then we have negative two times negative one which is 2, and then 2 minus 1 is 1. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So what is this doing? Okay, so let's, let's think about the number line, okay, because one way to kind of visualize this, all th this whole thing here is to look at the number line. This, this is the natural number line here, and these are the um, integers. So what are we doing? are mapping out all the even numbers and the integers to or all the number all the positive numbers from all integers into the even numbers on the real number line then into the, the nat natural number line yeah, but that's the close enough uh-huh and then all the negative numbers or all the negative integers into the odd numbers on the uh, natural number line yep um, in sequential order This is zero, and this is zero as well. So that's what we're doing. Okay, is that a function? Am I mapping every integer to one and only one natural number? Yes. Can you think of a an integer that does not get mapped? No, they, they all got mapped, okay. Is it an injection? Am I mapping every integer to a unique natural number? Yes. Yes. Okay. It, it kind of makes sense, right? Because you know, for positive ones, they all map to twice the original integer value. For the negative ones, you know, they map to the odd numbers you know, in correspondence to the magnitude. Okay. So the third question is, is it surjective? How would you answer that question? In other words, if I just go to the natural number line and go like, bing, I'm picking this one. Which integer maps to here? Okay, can I always answer that question? Yes. And how would you figure that out? How would you figure out which integer maps to this natural number? I'm sure that there's a, we could do a formula for it. <laughs> so so we'll do it by hand first, okay? Just like what I said in my CISP 310 class, you know, you start with doing it by hand, and then once you do it by hand a few times, then you start to generalize the approach. It's like, oh, okay, so that's how we do this, okay? So I'm just going to pick you know, a number out of thin air, 691 as a natural number. So I'm asking you, f of what is 691? How would you approach this problem? Mm -hmm. um, you could do a ternary expression. Um, if okay, you, but you're thinking a little bit too far ahead. I like where you're going, but I just want to do this one single one by hand. Okay. Just looking at 691, I want to figure out what integer maps to the natural number 691. So we could determine if it's even or odd. Uh-huh, it is odd, okay. Um, so because it's odd, Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that it's going to be negative. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, we know that the negative numbers were all uh, multiplied by two, multiplied by negative two, mm -hmm. and then subtracting one. So we'd have to add one to this to make uh -huh. it six ninety-two. Uh huh. And so then add one. From there, we could divide by two to get us three hundred and forty-six. Mm-hmm. 
and then divide uh, by negative two. Yeah, so we, uh, mm -hmm. divide by negative two, which gives us uh, negative 346. Right, so 692, the whole thing divided by negative two is negative 346. Yep, exactly. Huh, okay, let's try another one. Uh, could you write the ternary function again? Not yet. Oh, you mean uh, you mean the original so one? Yeah, the one that we're referencing. I'm not going to write it again. <laughs> <laughs> it is in the notes too, actually. Okay. Yep. But you know, you, it may not be exactly the same like this one, but it's about the same. I might have flipped the uh, polarity of the Boolean expression and flipped the then versus the else, but it's the same idea. Okay. So. The next one is easier because I'm giving you, oops, <coughs> next page. So I'm giving you a net, uh, a even number to begin with. Uh, let's say 468. Okay. So f of what? Okay. What integer is going to map to the natural number of 468? So the first thing we notice is it's an even number, right? So that implies the you know, question mark is non-negative because zero is non-negative. So if it's non-negative, what do we need to do? Simple stuff. <coughs> Just divided by two. Yep, exactly. So 468 divided by two is 234. Okay, so this thing here is supposed to be negative 346. This thing here is supposed to be 234. <coughs> so now that we have done it by hand and sort of kind of worked out how we do this, then we go like, huh, the first thing we need to do is to figure out whether the natural number is odd or even. For odd numbers, this is what we do. For even numbers, this is what we do. So now we generalize the whole thing and turn it into an equation. <coughs> So without flipping to another page, let me find a spot to do this. I will do it at the top here. So f inverse of x is to first determine whether it is odd or even. How do I do that? Ternary expression. Ternary expression. But what do we use, what do we use as the condition of the ternary expression? Uh, the x mod 2 uh, is equivalent to 0. Whether it is 0 or not. Okay, and if so, what do we do? If it is the case, that means we're dealing with this one here because it's even, and what do we do when it is even? Sorry? Divided by two. Okay, so we just return x divided by two. Otherwise, what do we do? x plus 1 divided by negative 2 because we have to flip the sign. So you can do the negation anywhere, okay? But it just has to be either negating the whole thing or you can negate the denominator. They would do the same thing. Okay. I think we just figure out the inverse function. That's why I use... Oh, you guys cannot see the entire thing because of the clock. No, you can see the entire thing. Right here. Okay. So that's the inverse function. So we have a function. We have an inverse function. Wait. Hold on a second here. If f has an inverse function, what do we know about f? Bijection. It's a bijection. Very good. Okay. So if it's a bijection, why, what, why does this matter? Because anything, any set that has a bijective function mapping to or from the set of all natural numbers has the same cardinality of L of null. We are talking about an entire classification of sets that as long as you can have a function that is bijective to map either to or from the set of natural numbers, that new kind of mysterious set is also known to have a cardinality of L of null. Is that okay? And this is also why we can now say, hmm. 
this is why you know this is olive note and I have to remember how the squiggly goes I think that's is that the correct direction yeah okay close enough close enough <laughs> all right okay well hmm that's kind of mysterious already because we are looking at the set of integers and the set of natural numbers. The set of natural numbers is actually a proper subset of the set of integers, and yet they have the same cardinality. It's like, it doesn't make sense. So we'll work on something that even that's even weirder. Okay, we'll look at a coordinate system. Okay, so we are going to take a look at a coordinate system. So we are looking at we'll just say natural number. Cartesian product with natural number. I know you know, I'm bad with these notations So we look at this set here, and then we ask What about this one? Okay What would be in this particular set? Let's call this set X Okay, so set X is going to have what kind of element? 0 0 is in X right 1 0 is going to be in X 200, 600 is in X, and so on. Are we doing okay so far? So for those of you who have done any work with game programming you know, or graphics and stuff, this is just like, oh, but this is just how we designate pixels on the screen. Pixel stands for picture element. So every picture, pixel, every picture element has a X you know, offset and a Y offset. This is the x offset. This is the y offset. Okay. Are we good so far? Okay. So the set x is what we're interested in, and then we are asking, what is the cardinality of this x here? <clears throat> so I'm going to show you that this particular x, as defined here, has the same cardinality as that. I know that you go like but that doesn't make sense it absolutely does not make sense because the natural number is a single line right and then X here is a two-dimensional kind of thing because it spans a space you know, two-dimensional space in this case it just does not make sense well all we need to do is to find that bijection so how would you create a bijection so that you can map from the two map from x to the set of natural numbers and you know because as soon as we find a bijection we are done proving that the cardinality of x is out of known. So how would you do that? <clears throat> In other words how do we define a new function? We'll call this g, okay? So we'll we want to find function g such that g is mapping from the Cartesian product of natural numbers, mapping it to just the set of natural numbers. And we want g to be bijective. Because if we don't want g to be bijective, it's easy. Map every single pixel to zero. That will work. That's a function, right? But we need it to be a bijection in order to establish that the cardinality of x, which is the Cartesian product of natural number with natural number, is out of known. So how would you approach this? So this is where... Yes, go ahead. That would not be uh, a bijection because you would end up mapping multiple pixels to the same natural number. I think. Wait, how? So you can you can work through a few examples. You know, I I, need, I really need to see the expression because I cannot. Uh, oh. My audible. 
Okay, basically what, basically what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. UV, okay, so you have a two level of UV. Mm -hmm. You can be any natural number. Mm -hmm. So can be. Yeah, so can be. But, okay. Uh, basically, if U is zero, then plus one, then plus one. <coughs> Plus one to what? Plus one to V. Plus one to V. So we have V plus one. And then what do we do with it? And then if it isn't, if U isn't zero, then times two U equals V. Wait, but you cannot change U or V. Because U and V are inputs. They are basically your parameters to the function. And we want to figure out to what value to return, and we want that to be unique to the values of u and v. Okay, so all right. So this seems to be a, a mathematical question that can you know kind of challenge you know, the mathematician mathematicians. But a person who has experience you know laying down tiles would answer this one. It's like oh I know the answer right away. Why do you think that is the case? How many people have tried to lay tiles in the bathroom or kitchen or anything like that? I'm just talking about square tiles. So how do you lay tiles? First, you gotta put the, uh, a lot of light. You gotta put the cement <laughs> <laughs> mixture of the, uh, what do you call it? The grout. The grout. Mm -hmm. And then you gotta make sure that all the pieces are the same. You gotta, you know. Right, but what is you gotta have a pattern. Right, but let's just say we are going for like super boring. You know, it's just everything is a square, and we are not looking for specific patterns. So the question is, with a room this big, and let's just say we are dealing with tiles about this big, are you going to row it? You know, you know, do it row by row. How are you going to do it? Or are you going to do it randomly? Like I'll just put a tile here, put a tile here, and then we'll, when we when we see a gap, we'll just have to cut a tile. You know, get half a tile and squeeze it into the gap. So how do you do that? Row by row. Row by row. Wow, that's not how the professionals do it. <laughs> the professionals do it in a diagonal way. <clears throat> all right. So just grind up all the tiles to base and just shut it all down. So the the professionals would do something like this. They would lay down a tile here. So this is the first tile. This is the second tile. This is the third tile fourth tile, fifth tile, sixth tile, the seventh, and so on. Okay, there's a reason for this, okay, because if you lay down the entire row first, um, you can have, end up with a crooked line, and then all the additional rows can amplify the crookedness. But if you do it this way, then it doesn't happen like that. So, and then you hold on a second here. I think we just answered the question, right? Because all you have to do is to fill in the space in a diagonal way. So, okay, that's, uh, that's not intended. Let me get rid of that stuff. There we go. All right, so you just basically go like this. And then you just keep sweeping in a diagonal way and expand the diagonal lines in this direction. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's why you know someone who has experience you know, laying down tile will answer this question right away. It's like, oh, I know how to do that. Because now, if, even if your room is infinitely large, you still would be able to lay down tiles to cover that room. I mean, it would take an infinite amount of time to cover the entire room. But given any time, you'll be in the process of doing this, right? <clears throat> okay, so we're going to fill in a few more new values here. So the next one is going to be 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, so I think this, this is good enough. Okay, you look at this and go like, okay, so is that it? I mean, you know, that we, we got the answer. Well, sort of. Because if I were to ask you, and I say, hmm, I want to figure out what is the G of the coordinate of 101 
and 414. What is that number? And then you guys would go like, well, give us a few weeks. I will we'll figure out the answer. Right? Because you're basically filling in. Oh, okay. I cannot. What did I do? I think I just clicked the wrong button. Okay, there we go. So if, you, if I ask you what is the value of your corresponding to row 101 and column, excuse me, column 101 and row 414, you're going to have to do fill, 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 fill until you get to that diagonal line and then work all your way up to you know, that particular cell. Then you can tell me, oh, so the natural number corresponding to this location is blah, blah, blah. Okay, and that's with if you try to do the calculation or try to figure out the solution without a closed form. What is a closed form? What does it mean in math? There's an N there's on both, or there's an N on both sides. So a closed form means you're only using operators that we're familiar with, like addition, subtraction, square, power, division, mod, that sort of stuff. Okay. So if I want to get the closed form of this function g, how would we do that? How, how would you approach this? Okay, if I say, okay, you know, your life depends on the closed form of this g function, where do you start? Remember, programming and math is about patterns. Yes? So I know that if you look to the right, um, mm -hmm. the x is Zero, one, three, six, ten. Very good. Increase by one. Well, addition by one. So you would have to. Yes. So. The east side, the summation. Mm-hmm. Right. Very good. Okay. So you have observed a pattern by only focusing on the first row, right? So you're focusing on only the first row. We have zero, one. 3, 6, 10 at this point. What is the next one? The next one is easy because you know, we just, we're just we right at the cusp 15. of you. It's 15. But then what is the next one? 21. What is the next one? 28. 28. All right. So what are we looking at here? What, what is the pattern? And believe me, you know, if you're going to take any type of IQ test, most of the questions are not exactly in a numerical form, but they're, they're basically asking, can you figure out a pattern? But in this case, what is the pattern? 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 plus 3 is 6. 6 plus 4 is 10, and so on. In other words, the gap between the adjacent number is just the next natural number. So if you are to look at the delta between the numbers, what do you have? So let's try to figure out the pattern here. <clears throat> uh, let's do green. Okay. So the gap between these two is a 1. Between these two is a 2. That's a 3. That's a 4. That's a 5, 6, 7. So the next one is likely to be 8. And so on. Huh. Okay. That means, you know, if, I, if I'm if i only interested in the bottom row, I'm not interested in any other row, okay, then I can see how I can come up with a sigma notation first. So we'll deal with, deal with the sigma notation. Okay. Here we go. So if we are only interested in row 0, which means the y is a 0, and you know, x is some kind of x here. Then we are looking at 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus blah, 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 all the way up to, I think it is, including x itself. There we go. Does that make sense? Well, we plug in the numbers and see if it makes sense, right? So we say, OK, well, let's check the theory. g of 0, 0 is just 0. Okay, well, that seems to make sense. G of, let's pick something a little bit more challenging. Let's do the, uh, 
where the 6 is, what is the coordinate of this particular pixel? 3, 0. 3, 0. Okay, very good. So we're trying to figure out what is 3, 0. We say it is 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3. Oh, okay. That seems to work out. It is indeed 6. Okay. So that gives me some confidence that I might have figured out at least a pattern to it. Yep. I found out what the pattern is for the vertical lines as well. Okay. Um, Once you figure out the, the baseline, the vertical yeah. line is easy because you know, the, uh, the Y displacement is what you need to add to the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I still do not have a closed form because sigma notation is not a closed form. Because all I have figured out right now is that, right? Now, some of you would look at this in your sigma notation and immediately know the answer to that question because you have been taught already of you know, what that sigma notation would boil down to as a closed form. What if you have not? Okay, what if you have not been exposed to the closed form of this sigma notation? How do you figure out the closed form of that sigma notation? What, what, what would you do? What do you notice when you, when you go through these examples? Okay, so we're going to go like um, the sigma of i going from 0 to 6, okay? is of i is just 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. So what is the pattern here? Okay, when we look for a pattern, we're looking for something that is constant, something that can cancel out, something that can simplify this whole thing. So we look at this and go like, hmm, I think I can see a certain pattern here. If I add 0 to 6, it is 6. If I add 1 to 5, it is also 6. If I add 2 and 4, it is also 6. Yeah, this 3 is kind of dangling. Huh. So, and how many times do I have to add 6? Looks like it's something like 6 divided by 2, right? Because I'm pairing up the first item with the last item, the second item with the last second last item. So that means I have approximately you know, 6 divided by 2 pairs to begin with. And then I have a dangling unit, which is kind of like, eh, I'm just one half of that x is, but I'm just kind of dangling. You know, I don't have anyone to pair up with. Does that make sense? All right. So, but what if we have i going from 0 to 5 only? Okay, then we have 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. 0 and 5 pairs up, 1 and 4 pairs up, 2 and 3 pairs up, we are good. We don't have a dangling thing you know, running around because there is an even number of items to add as opposed to there's, a, there's an odd number of items to add. Are we doing okay so far with this pattern? Like what, I'm, what we are seeing here? Is that okay? All right. So it would appear that I have two cases. We have a case when it is even and the case when it is odd. The first one is when it's odd. The second one is when, is when the numbers are you know, even. So what I have done so far is to identify that we have this. <laughs> this is what I really enjoy doing. You know, some people do quilting. You know, some people garden. And I do this sort of thing. That is, this is my hobby. Okay, so you look at this and go like, what is that? Well, let's take a look, okay? I know you may not want to derive these things, but you should be able to follow the derivation. All right, so the first line, I'll be okay with the first line because that's exactly what we saw earlier, okay? And then we generalize it using the sigma notation, okay? But it's not a closed form because a sigma notation is just a shorthand. You still have to add up all the individual items, you know, which is tedious. And then we notice that if x is an odd number, then we have an even number of items and we can just break up the original sigma into two sigma, where this is the first half of the sigma, the first half of the number, this is the second half. On the other hand, if x mod 2 is 0, which means x itself is even, then we have an odd number of items where the single out item is 
exactly x divided by 2, and then we have the first half and also the second half. Are we good, oh, doing okay so far? Okay, you don't have to know exactly how the numbers match up, just the general idea. And then the most important part here is how I combine the two sigmas here into one single sigma. How did that happen? What did I do with you know, where the mouse point is pointing to? So how did I go from here to here? That's all I'm asking. What did I do? What is the trick that allows me to do that? I'm missing one intermediate step here. From where to where? Hmm? From where to where? From, okay, let me... From this step here, from this portion, to the same portion on the following line. Why are those the same thing? I'm missing one step in between that I did not spell out. Okay, so what do you do when you see notations like this? Okay, what if you are required to understand the derivation? You sit down in the corner and you try to At first, yes. <laughs> <laughs> At first, yes. That would, that would be a natural response to most people. And then what do you do? You plug in concrete values, okay? Instead of looking at some kind of unknown x, okay, you just go like, okay, we know x is supposed to be a odd number because this is the then value of the ternary expression. So you go like, okay, we'll go ahead and pick a odd number, okay? Pick some low odd number, okay? Not 691. Five. Five, okay. So you say, okay, what if, what if, what if x is five? So if x is 5, then this one here is going from 0 to 2, and then this one is going from 3 to 5. Okay, all right. So the first, the first sigma goes from 0 to 2. The second sigma goes from 3 to 5. Okay, all right. So that means you know, we are generating 0, 1, 2 for this i. We are generating... 3, 4, and 5 for that i. Is that okay? All right. So now you look at the second one, and you go like, okay, we are combining the two sigmas back into one single sigma, but it doesn't look like the original one. So what, what is the trick here? It goes from 0 to 2. And this i is still generating the usual, which is the 0, 1, and 2. What about this term here, x minus i? x is 5, by the way. So i is still going from 0 to 2. 5 minus 0 is 5. 5 minus 1 is 4. 5 minus 2 is 3. So this term is generating the same terms that this i is generating. Is that okay? So that is what, that's what is allowing me to combine these two sigma into this one single sigma here. They go like, attack. Isn't, aren't we just running in circles? Because we started off with a single sigma, we break it, break it up into two sigmas, and now we're back to one single sigma. You go like, what did we gain? Wait, this i here is canceled by this minus i here. And i is the only thing that is changing per iteration. x is a constant. In our example, x is 5. It doesn't change. So that means when you look at something like this, it's like, oh, so we are just adding 5 how many times? How many times are we adding 5? Well, let's take a look. This is from 0 to x minus 1, the whole thing divided by 2. x is 5, 5 minus 1 is 4, 4 divided by 2 is 2. So we have how many iterations? We started with 0. 0, 1, 2, we got three iterations. So that means, oh, so isn't that the same thing as just multiplying this 5 by 3? Yep, that's what we're doing. So we are basically just looking at the AND value here, add 1 to it because you know, we got one additional iteration when i equals to 0, 
and multiply that, which is the number of times we go through the iterations, by x. Because every single time we go through that loop, we're just adding x to the sum, and x does not change. Is that okay? More or less, okay? And now we get this equation here, and then you go like, um, but this is just that, right? Because minus one plus two is just adding one, and then we move this x over here, and now we have this closed form. This is a closed form, because we just have multiplication, addition, and the subtraction. Are we good so far? So I'm not going to explain in details what the other side is doing, but eventually it boils down to exactly the same thing. In other words, doesn't matter whether x is odd or even, we still end up with the same expression to get to the closed form, which is nice because now we can just go like, oh, so if the then value and the else value of the ternary expression is exactly the same, why do we have a ternary expression then? Because it doesn't make sense whether x is odd or not, we still have exactly the same expression. So this is the closed form. Are we good so far? So for those of you who have seen this closed form before, were you taught the actual derivation? Or was it done by, okay, so this is the observation. Looks like this will make it work. And then that's the end of the quote unquote proof. That's the most infamous kind of proof, which is summarized by a single word. But what word do you think that is? I know it's hard to guess what is in my mind. That word is obvious. <laughs> you, you, you see mathematicians and even computer scientists going through a bunch of stuff and then, and then suddenly they just pop up with, obviously this has to be true, done. There's no actual proof. This is an actual proof. It may not be the shortest one, may not be the most elegant one, but it is one. Why do you think that is important? Why didn't I just say, oh, by the way, <laughs> this is obviously that. Because I need to kill time in this class. There's too, too little material, too much time. I just need to kind of fill it up with fluff. Yeah. Yep. OK, well, I'm going to share. We only got two minutes left. And I promise you, it's, it's going to be, this will not be on the test. When I was working on my uh, PhD dissertation, my advisor told me, OK, so you, you know, to continue the work on a particular you know, topic, uh, you can use this particular theorem, blah, 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 blah. I look at the blah, 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 and go like, well, that kind of makes sense. Intuitively, kind of makes sense. And then after a week, I go like, no, it really does not seem to make sense. So I went back to my advisor, and I asked him and go like, um, do we have a proof of this particular theorem? Because if my entire dissertation is going to be start, you know, based on this you know, theorem, I really want to make sure it is true. My advisor said, yeah, yeah it's done in the so and so's your master's thesis. So I went up to dig up the master's thesis, and guess what kind of proof it had? The obviously. <laughs> they go like, no, it's, it's not obvious to me, OK? And I told my advisor about that. He said, no, no, you can just go ahead and move on. I mean, this is, you know, this is, it's, it's, it makes sense. I go like, but it doesn't make sense to me. I spent one week to come up with a counter example. Because to prove something is not, okay, is wrong, you just need one single counter example. And I found that counter example, I brought it back to my advisor, and then his only feedback was, oh, that was it, okay? But it was really important because if I had used that theorem to begin with, it would have invalidated everything else that I built on, on top of that. So I went back to the AI lab, the artificial intelligence lab, and I told the other guy, and go like, oh, by the way, I just found a counter example and proved this theorem is wrong. That guy just went ballistic. Guess why? Because he's done with his master's thesis already, or close to being done, and his entire master's thesis was based on that theorem. <laughs> just outside that one example, this works. Yes. <laughs> 
No, you have a whole classification of examples that will make it not work. <laughs> So that is why, you know, when I teach classes such as this one, and also in 310, you know, when I say, hmm, that's a claim, you know, I can look up on the internet and find the answer, but I need to prove it myself so that I feel confident that I know how the proof goes, okay? And I feel confident that, yep, this has to be true because I just finished the proof. And on top of that, it's also my hobby. So I just go like, oh, yes, I can You're do this. Destroying other people's masterpieces. <laughs> <laughs> My actual hobby is this. Okay. This is how the whole thing is represented. You go like, okay, doesn't look too bad, right? So we'll go ahead and copy the clipboard. Okay, I promise this is the last, last bit that I want to share with you because. That's the kind of professor you're dealing with here. Oh, no, that's not what I want. Mouse pad. So let me show you what the actual LaTeX representation looks like here. Okay. Oh, come on. No. There we go. <laughs> so this is the LaTeX representation of the uh, equation that I showed you a little bit earlier. So you can kind of imagine typing this was a little bit difficult because you know there's no, I mean this is there's no visual tool. Okay, I have to type like this and run a command line tool to visualize what it looks like. So there's a lot of back and forth because I go like, oh man, I missed that. You know, close parenthesis, go back there, change a few things, come back and look at it and go like, okay, that looks almost right, but I'm missing something again. So that was kind of that's how I write my notes. But as I said, it's kind of my hobby. All right, so for you guys, okay, I want you to read ahead, okay? So we are kind of done with this part here. So I want you to read ahead at least up to the beginning of G inverse. In other words, I will get to the closed form of G relatively quickly on Wednesday. But we'll also get into how to figure out the inverse of G, which means I giving I've given you a natural number, sixty thousand six hundred and thirteen. Where is it in the tiles? Okay, so we want to reverse the process. My notes actually talk about the process of finding the inverse function, so you can read through that. Okay, because it's basically reading through just reasoning of how to derive an answer, which I think is actually more important than the answer itself. All right, so I'll see you on Wednesday, same time, same channel. That's a reference to the original Batman series. Um, do you know what our first exam is going to be? Around week five or six? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, so we